Good morning, everybody, and a happy Mother's Day to the mums out there. Uh, there is a song by a band that I like that has a lyric, Use your imagination and start a fire. Use your imagination and start a fire. And I gather that uh, what's being implied by this lyric is that our imaginations can actually result in us doing quite powerful and wonderful things. Indeed, uh, think about it, all the great inventions of the world started in someone's imagination. They imagined what could be and what path they would have to take in order to reach uh, that goal. Uh, the great works of art, the great uh, works of literature, the great songs all started off in someone's imagination. They imagined an image to paint. They imagined a world to describe in a story. They imagined different sounds to bring together in a song. Now, friends, this morning we come to the second of the Ten Commandments in our series on the Ten Commandments. And uh, as we come to the second of the commandments, what we see is that when it comes to how we can know God, when it comes to how we can approach God, when it comes to how we are to worship God, we need to turn our imaginations off. We are not to use our imaginations to conceive of what God might be like, to conceive of how we should approach him or worship him. No, as we look at the second commandment, it becomes evident that we are to rely instead on God's revelation, how he reveals himself to us, how he reveals how he is to be approached, how he reveals how he is to be worshipped, and obviously that is in his word where we find that revelation. Now, before we dive into the second commandment and uh, why it is we need to be focused on God's revelation rather than our imaginations, uh, let me just remind you, especially for those who weren't here last week, of the context in which the Ten Commandments are found. Friends, a lot of people think that the Ten Commandments are the pathway which, if we obey, will lead to God's favour. But the Bible teaches no such thing. Uh, last week we saw that the people of Israel had actually received God's favour before he called upon them to obey him in the Ten Commandments. God had already chosen the people of Israel out of all the nations to be his own people, something which they didn't deserve. Uh, he had showered his favour upon them by rescuing them from slavery in the land of Egypt. And having showered this favour upon the people of Israel, he then says, here are the commands you are to keep. Uh, friends, for us today, um, the way we receive God's favour, again, is not by keeping the Ten Commands. We don't receive eternal life by keeping the Ten Commandments. No, friends, God's favour is a free and thoroughly undeserved gift made available to us in Jesus. Jesus who lived the perfect life of obedience that we did not live. Jesus who died in our place to take the punishment for our failure to obey God. It is through Jesus alone that we can receive God's favour and having received God's favour simply with the empty hands of faith, receiving that free gift, the Ten Commandments now show us how to live in a way which is pleasing to God in response to receiving that favour. That context is really, really important. If we don't understand that, we totally misunderstand the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Now, last week we saw that the first commandment focuses on who we are not to worship, whereas the second commandment that we're focusing on today focuses on how we are not to approach and worship God. So look at uh, Exodus 20, verses 4 to 5a again. It says, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Now, friends, uh, remember last week we heard that surrounding the people of Israel uh, were a whole bunch of uh, other people who worshipped other gods. Okay, they worshipped other gods. 
And the way in which these people approached and worshipped these other gods was by making an image of some kind uh, out of metal or out of stone or out of wood. Uh, They would uh, make this image in the form that they thought represented the god or the gods that they worshipped. And then they would approach that god or gods by coming to that image, by coming to that idol and by worshipping that idol. In their minds, their god was very much bound up, bound up with this representation of them. In the first commandment, God says, you're not to worship any of these other gods because they're not real. In the second commandment, he says, when you worship me, you are not to worship me in the way in which these people worship their false gods. You are not to somehow use your imagination to conceive an image of me and to make that image and then to use that as a means to approach me and worship me. You are not to do that. Uh, Friends, I think a classic example of a time when this commandment was broken was the incident of the golden calf in Exodus 32. Uh, In Exodus 32, Moses is uh, up on the mountain getting laws from God, ironically laws about how God is to be approached and worshipped. And uh, the people start to despair because Moses, if you like, is the mediator between the people of Israel and God. And Moses has been gone for quite some time and the people are worried Moses is gone. If Moses is gone, how do we connect with God? How do we connect with him if Moses is gone? And so they come up with the idea of constructing the golden calf. Uh, I take it that this uh, calf was meant to represent the power which God had displayed when he rescued them from slavery in the land of Egypt. But friends, God was not at all happy. He was so unhappy that he was about to wipe out the people of Israel for this sin, except for the intercession of Moses. And I take it that a way in which the breach of the second commandment occurs today is as people go to church buildings where they find statues of Jesus and feel that these statues are the way in which they are to approach God, approach Jesus and worship him. I take it that's how this command is broken today. Now, it's worth noting though that what I've just described to you is a little bit different to how we see the Bible talk about idolatry generally. Um, Quite often when the Bible talks about Israel engaged in idolatry, it's talking about situations where they're worshipping Baal or the Ashtoreths or Chemosh or Moloch. Uh, You know, they're they're worshipping these foreign gods, these false gods, and using the idols to do that. But friends, that's primarily a breach of the first commandment, worshipping other gods. Uh, The New Testament today talks about greed as being idolatry, a love of money as being idolatry. But again, I'd want to suggest to you that's primarily a breaching of the first commandment, worshipping another god. The second commandment is not so much focused on who you worship. It's focused on how you worship the one true God. And what does God say? When it comes to approaching him, when it comes to worshipping him, you are not to make images which your imagination thinks represent God. That's not what you are to do. And there's a key reason why we're not to do that. We are not to engage in idolatry, that is, we are not to use uh, images as a way to approach or represent God because it arouses jealousy in God. Uh, We read in verses 5b to 6 of Exodus 20, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Notice that little word for there. It explains why God tells the people of Israel that they are not to make images of him and to worship those things. For I, the Lord your God, am 
a jealous God. Uh, quite often we think of jealousy in negative terms. There's the saying, jealousy is a curse. But friends, with God, it is quite appropriate. It is quite appropriate. And indeed, uh, what we are going to see, friends, is that uh, breaching the second command actually arouses God's jealousy for at least three reasons. And we'll go into those in a moment. Notice, though, that God gets so jealous if people breach the second commandment, if people create images that they believe to be of him. Notice he gets so jealous that it results in him wanting to punish. Uh, some people wonder if God's being quite just here. It sounds like that uh, children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the idolaters get punished because of the sin uh, of the forefather. Ezekiel 18 uh, indicates to us that if the son of someone who sins, that the son won't be punished for the sins of the father if the son is righteous in and of themselves. Okay? Uh, if the second, third, fourth generations hate God, they will come under the punishment. That's the idea there. But notice that the punishment is really for the lifetime of the idolater. Notice that God's love, though, extends way beyond the lifetime of those who loved him. But anyway, as I said, there are three reasons that I want to suggest to you as to why the breaking of the second commandment, the making of an image to represent God, arouses great jealousy in him. First of all, our making idols to represent God makes him jealous because idols diminish his glory. On the screen, I've got a picture of the uh, soccer player Cristiano uh, Ronaldo and... Next to it is an image that was made purportedly of Cristiano Ronaldo. But you kind of look at it and you go, really? That's meant to be Cristiano Ronaldo? Um, and in fact, if I was Cristiano Ronaldo and that image was made of me, I'd think, do you think I look like that? Like, I'm much better looking than that. That's what I'd be thinking if I was Ronaldo. Like, that's quite ugly compared to me. Like, this is an insult. This is what you think I look like? Uh, imagine, yeah, it's Mother's Day. Imagine you think, I'm going to have a statue made of my mother or an artwork done of my mother. And imagine it's not very flattering. How do you think mum would feel? Being given a present of an image that really, really is not flattering of her. Wouldn't be good, would it? Well, friends... If Renata has every right to be insulted by that image, how much right does God have to be insulted when people make images of him? Uh, listen to what Isaiah 46 verses 5 to 9 says. This is God speaking, With whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in its place and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. God is very clear. He has no equals. There is none like him. He is beyond our imaginations, friends. We cannot fully conceive of him as he is. We just can't. We're limited. And what happens when we do make idols of God? What happens? Well, we make idols that can't speak, that can't think, that can't feel, that can't actually do anything, that are lifeless. And we say, this represents God? How insulted must God be? Friends, God loves his glory and his honour more than anything else. He is jealous of his glory and honour. And when people think that they can represent him through a lifeless statue, there's a great insult to God. It diminishes his glory. 
in much profound ways, very profound ways. So that's the first reason. It's a great insult to God to create an image and to say, that's him. Secondly, our making idols of God makes him jealous because it is his role to create images of himself. Uh, Before I uh, started in full-time ministry, I worked at Telstra uh, for six years and I used to coordinate landlines and satellites for TV and radio broadcasts. And so I was in the sort of administrative section. Uh, So I would deal with the customers and then I would tell the technicians what needed to be done. Well, at one point, uh, the administrative section was housed in the same place as where all the technical people were and all the technical equipment was. And when we went there, the technical people were very clear to say, don't touch anything. You are admin people. You are not technical people. You have not been trained. You can come in and watch TV uh, in the technical area if you ever want to, but don't touch a thing. Don't think that you can do our jobs. So it was a very, very strong line of demarcation that was put in place, and rightly so, because we were not trained to do the technical things. We would have broken the system if we were let loose on it. Well, friends, I think there is a sense that when we engage in trying to create images of God, that we actually step on his turf. We step on an area that he alone is responsible for. Uh, Look at what Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27 says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals over all the creatures that move along the ground so god created mankind in his own image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them friends we don't need to create images of god Ah, God is the one who creates them. Indeed, there's about 7 billion of them in our world right now. Namely, us. Uh, Here we are on Mother's Day. Uh, We celebrate those who gave us birth. Well, they gave us birth, but they didn't make us our mothers. It's God who made us. It's he who gave us life. And he created us to be in his image. We are little idols of God, if you like, running around the world. Now, being made in the image of God doesn't mean we look like God. Jesus tells us in John 4, God is spirit, no flesh and bones. It's not a case of we look like God. No, the idea, according to these verses, seems to be that just as God rules over all things, so God has created us in his image to be mini rulers over his creation on his behalf. So our act of ruling displays a likeness to God. But I want to suggest to you, friends, that our ability to speak, to think, to feel, uh, our ability to kind of wrestle with ideas like what's right and wrong and you know, that sort of stuff also relate to this idea of being created in the image of God. What happens when we create images of God? They are lifeless idols, aren't they? They can't speak, they can't think, they can't do anything. When God creates images, very different. See, friends, we're not meant to be image makers. We're meant to be image bearers. That's what we're meant to be doing. Our job is not to make images. Our job is to bear the image of God. The problem is we fail to do that. We fail to do that appropriately because we don't rule over the world on God's behalf. No, we want to do what we want to do. We don't want God telling us what to do. And when we speak and when we think and when we feel and when we act, we don't do those things in ways that are actually truly reflective of God because the way in which we speak and think and act and feel is not pure as God is pure. Friends, we fail to do what we're meant to do, to bear the image of God. Our job is not to make images of God. There is a sense, friends, when when we're creating idols, we're really saying, God, we're on the same level as you. We get to do the same thing you do, which is not the case at all. God is jealous of the fact that he alone is the creator. And thirdly, 
our using idols to approach and worship God makes him jealous because it is his right to determine how he is to be approached and worshipped. So again, today is Mother's Day. And let's just imagine that uh, uh, your mother uh, or your wife, whoever it is that's being celebrated today, says, today I want to go to this place to eat because this is the place that I like to go to eat. This is the place that serves food that I like. That's what I want. And if you're thinking about a present, uh, don't think about, you know, uh, irons or, you know, any other kind of appliances. I don't want those. This is what I want, okay? And you and your wisdom think, why does mum want to go to that restaurant? I don't like that restaurant. No, no, we're going to book in somewhere else instead. And, you know, mum needs appliances. So, you know, I don't want to buy a blouse for her or whatever it is. I feel more comfortable buying an appliance for her. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, when Mother's Day comes and she goes to the restaurant she didn't want to go to and receives presents that she didn't want, how do you think she'll feel? She'll feel ticked off because she'll say, I'm the mum, it's Mother's Day, it's my right to determine where we will celebrate this and what I get, not yours. And friends, when it comes to how we approach God and how we worship him, it's not our right to imagine how that should be done. It's God's right to reveal how that is to be done. And indeed, friends, when we look at the Old Testament, we see that God gave the Israelites specific laws about how and where he was to be approached and worshipped. Uh, indeed, we see that God gave laws to Moses that resulted in the construction of a thing called the Tent of Meeting. Uh, the tent of meeting, this tent had two rooms and in the back room called the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God dwelt amongst the people of Israel. But friends, the people couldn't just walk into this area and go into the tent and pull the curtain back as to where the presence of God was and just go in there. Now God said, I'm happy to dwell with you but if you're going to approach me, there's a whole bunch of things you need to be aware of Notice that there's an altar here in front of the tent, an altar where sacrifices had to be made for sins. And that communicated very clearly that sin puts a barrier between God and us. You cannot actually come and approach God unless you deal with the problem of sin. And the Old Testament laws also demanded that it couldn't be the people who offered the sacrifices, no, priests or mediators, if you like, were put in place by God. Certain people from certain family, they alone had the right to take the sacrifice and to offer it on behalf of the person and to pray for the person. God gave very strict instructions about how he was to be approached, about how he was to be worshipped. Uh, the tent of meeting was replaced by the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, God stipulated to the people that he would choose a place where his name would dwell, and that place was Jerusalem. And he made it very clear to the people, I don't want you sort of setting up altars in other places around the country. If you're going to come worship me, you've got to come to Jerusalem. God gave very strict instructions to the Israelites about how he was to be approached, how he was to be worshipped, and he was right to do so. Because God has the right to determine how he will be approached and worshipped. Well, for us today, friends, it's different. Uh, we don't have to go to Jerusalem to a temple and offer sacrifices as the people of Israel did. No, Jesus is the means by which we approach and worship God today. Look at what 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6a says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Friends, Jesus fulfills all the functions of the tent of meeting, of the temple and the way in which it worked. He fulfills all the functions. Notice he's described here as being a ransom for all people. You know why we don't offer animal sacrifices anymore to receive forgiveness of sins? Because through his sacrifice, Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins. He is our sacrifice once and for all time. Um, notice that Jesus is described as being the mediator between God and us. 
Uh, remember back in the day, the people needed priests to take the sacrifice and offer it to God on their behalf and pray on their behalf? Well, we don't need priests anymore because we've got Jesus. He is at the right hand of his Father, mediating between God and us. He is our intercessor. And remember that God dwelt amongst the people in the tent of meeting and then in the temple? Well, friends, Jesus is God with us. Uh, Look at uh, Colossians 1 verse 15. It says, The Son, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, That term firstborn, friends, doesn't mean that there was a time when Jesus did not exist. Uh, It's just a way of talking about how he is exalted above all creation. Indeed, Colossians 1 talks about it's how it's through Jesus that everything was actually created. Okay, But notice how Jesus is described here. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the one through whom God, the invisible God, he is the one who actually reveals God to the world. Colossians says that, Uh, the fullness of God's deity dwelt in Jesus' body. He is the image of the invisible God. Isn't it interesting? He is the image. What are we not to create? Images. So we don't have to create an image, friends, because God has provided an image for us. In Jesus. And when Jesus came into the world to reveal God, do the scriptures tell us how tall he was? What colour hair he had? What colour eyes he had? What his jaw line was like? What his cheekbones were like? Whether he was, you know, sort of uh, muscly or whatever. Are we given any sort of physical descriptions of Jesus? We're not, are we? Why? Because God knows that if we had that, what would we do? We'd make images, wouldn't we? That's what we do. No, when Jesus reveals God to us, what is revealed? What Jesus says. Jesus speaks what the Father speaks. Uh, The power of the Father is revealed through the signs that Jesus performs. That's how Jesus reveals God to us. We don't need to create images because we have the image in Jesus. Now, some people say, oh, but, you know, it'd be helpful to have stained glass windows with pictures of Jesus on it, could help us to focus, or it would be helpful to have a, you know, a statue of Jesus here because it would help us to focus as we come together, or it'd be helpful to have a wooden cross in here because it'd be helpful to help us to focus. But, friends, we don't need those things. Look at what Colossians 3, verse 16 says. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We don't need statues, we don't need stained glass windows, we don't need crosses, we have the message of Christ. And that's what we are to focus on so as to make sure we approach God and worship God correctly. That's what we are to focus on, friends as it is taught, as we replicate it in song, that is to be at the heart of what we do as we gather, so that we approach God and worship him correctly. And what does the message of Christ tell us about how we are to worship God? Well, it has nothing to do with bowing down before statues or crosses or things like that. No, Hebrews 13 verse 15 to 16 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. We don't offer animal sacrifices anymore because Jesus is our sacrifice. But friends, we are still to offer praise and thanks to God for all he is and for all that he has done for us. That is to mark out what happens as we gather together and as we're on our own. We should be continually praising and thanking God. But also doing good. Romans 12 talks about the idea of our lives being lived in sacrifice to God doing good. We worship God as we do good to others, friends. Our worship is not just on Sunday mornings at 10.30. It is to be 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, all of our lives. That's what the message of Christ tells us. So, again, I hope you can see that when it comes to how we are to know God, to approach God, to worship God, that we are to switch our imaginations off. For they will ultimately lead to us doing things that arouse the jealousy of God. If you find yourself saying, I like to imagine God as being, you're heading down the wrong path. I like to think that the way we should respond to God is, you're heading down the wrong path. What we need to say is, what does God say? What does God tell us about himself? What does God tell us about how to approach him? What does God tell us about how to worship him? If we are focused on God's revelation as opposed to our imaginations, we won't break the second commandment. Let's pray now that God would help us to honour him as he deserves to be honoured. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have revealed yourself to us. Father, you are far beyond our ability to imagine. But thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in a way in w- so that we can know you truly, so that we can be in right relationship with you through Jesus. And th- Father, thank you that you show us the right way to respond to your favour to us so that we can honour you for you, our great creator and saviour. You are worthy of all glory and honour and power and praise. And so, Father, please help us to keep the second commandment. Uh, Please, Father God, help us not to use our imaginations to create images of you and to think that we need those things to approach or worship you. Please spare us from that, Father, so that we might not bring dishonour to your holy name, so that we might not insult you. Father God, we thank you that in Christ you have sent us the image we need. Thank you that in Christ you have sent us the sacrifice we need, the mediator that we need. And so help us only to approach you through him and to worship you in his holy name. Help us to be a people who offer sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and of doing good to others. And we pray for this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.